Well, welcome to the circuit riding pasture. Instead of a horse, I'll be riding my iron horse. This is, uh, today the horse will be called Steadfast as we prepare for our ride in the country. I'm gonna go over a passage of scripture that hopefully will encourage you. The story of the prodigal son and hopefully a good take that we can all learn from. So let us get ready. You ready, son? No, I'm going to take front. Okay, 226 miles we have put on this thing so far. You ready? Well, ride along with us as uh, we go over some scripture today and see what the Lord has for us. Okay, here we go. Today's message is about the prodigal son, about apathy. This word apathy is something that is gravely wrong in human beings and definitely wrong in the church. What is apathy exactly? It could be marked as an interning of the eyes. To not care about anyone else than yourself or anyone else or any other one's problems but your own. To look inward and not outwards. The word apathy is not to have passion or empathy or concern for another human being. The Greek word pathos. To have passion and zeal and emotion. And to be apathetic is to be cold and indifferent, unmoved and unstirred. And unfortunately in our times that we live in there is a lot of apathy and a lot of uh, indifference towards other people's plights. And if there's any person or any individual or organization that needs to be full of compassion is the church. Because it is at the heart of our Savior. It is at the heart of the message of the gospel. And so Jesus is uh, questioned at the beginning of these parables. Check out this beautiful lake this morning as we take a look around. This is Falls Mills Dam here. But Jesus is questioned at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. The Pharisees and the religious leaders accuse him. It's not a question or an observation, it is an accusation. They say he eats with sinners and tax collectors. This is not just, again, an observation, but rather they're making a statement concerning his moral character about his righteousness because he's choosing to fellowship with those that are in the eyes of the church or the religious leaders to be sinners and through this accusation towards Jesus he begins to share um, really about the heart and the nature of the kingdom of God he shares that the in three parables two parables are pretty brief and short and they cut to the quick and then a longer period parable the third one which is the prodigal son but the first one is about the man with the 99 sheep and in essence he forsakes or he leaves the, the 99 to go looking for the uh, the one sheep and emphasis can be made when he finds that sheep he rejoices he's glad and a takeaway from that is it says not only does he rejoice, but it says that the angels in heaven rejoice when one that is lost is, is found. So we find in this a common sentiment that heaven rejoices. The heart of God, the throne of God rejoices when a sinner comes to salvation when he is found. If you're wondering where God's heart is, it is steeped into the heart of missions and the winning of the lost. Now this upcoming road is going to be very windy, so uh, we'll see how we can go with that. But the heart of the lost is where God's heart is. And it says the angels rejoice. When was the last time you were able to rejoice with something that wasn't related to your own bodily health? or well-being, your job, your marriage, your kids, uh, their enrollment, their college, their grades, whatever it might be. 
When was the last time you were able to rejoice because somebody came to know Jesus Christ? That they passed from death unto light, from light, from darkness unto light. Well, that's what the kingdom of God is about. Jesus then goes on to share another parable. And this parable is the parable of the... Uh, of the uh, sorry, I'm watching my eyes right now. It's the parable of the uh, lady who lost her dowry coin. Not just her, uh, not just the coin of rare value, so to speak, but part of her dowry coin. And so it says that she cleaned the house and she swept it until she found it. And notice the common thread here. When she finds it, she rejoices and she calls forth her neighbors. It says, rejoice with me for that the coin that I was lost I found it and so she rejoices over this again perhaps what's missing in the church the joy and the rejoicing that we have is that we've taken our eyes off of missions and we've taken our eyes off of seeking that the lost should be found and sorry tight turn here that our eyes have been lost off the mission. We've only got eyes for our own self, for our job, our well-being, our blessings, our benefits, our calling, our kids, our family. And no eyes that point outwards towards those that are lost. So there's a rejoicing there, but finally, we get into another tale of where apathy is seen, not only in one son, but in the other. Now we all readily identify with this first son. This, uh, I'm waiting on Henry to catch up. This first son who uh, tells his father, Father, give me what is mine that I can leave. Augustine calls this place the far country is in his heart. Before he ever left or stepped a foot out the door, he had already determined that he was going. This is the place of the heart. And as Pastor Mark Rutland said, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And once again, we see a son who is not concerned about his father, but his eyes are only towards himself and what he wants and what he needs. And you'll see this is even true in his repentance. Because he goes off to this far country and he begins to squander all that he has on riotous living, whatever that might be. But he spent it on himself and selfish pursuits. His eyes were not towards righteousness or towards his father, but only what he wanted to do. And it says after some time, we don't know how long, the parable kind of indicates that his father was wealthy and so it took some time. And so his son begins to uh, come to a point of need. There's famine in the land. There's perhaps a drought, unemployment. And so he finds himself in need and in want. And he says to himself, man, those pigs, man, I wish I could eat what they got. Now granted, we look at how dis distasteful that would be as a, uh, a Jew, but I want to tell you as a Gentile, I don't like the idea or the prospects of eating pig husks either. But he's at this place and he comes to himself, the scripture says. And he says, I'm going to go to my father. Are not his servants better fed than this? And I will go and tell my father that I'm unworthy. And I'm going to repent and tell him, Lord, or Father, take me in as one of your servants. And he goes back to his father. And for a moment now, let us look at the eyes of the father. The father is sitting there on the porch and he sees his son from afar off. We got to stop before we jump into the story of what the prodigal is doing, coming to his father. And let us stop and observe what the father is doing. He's on that porch looking for his son, his eyes. He sees him from afar off. And the question might be, we might ask ourselves, how long was he sitting on that porch? Is that the first time? Was it a routine that he did every day, every evening, in the beginning or the end of the day? Was it every day, every week, every month, every year, looking for his son? We know as fathers, as parents, how we long for our children. 
hope that they would be safe and come home safely. And I'm reminded of, of Jacob, how when his name was changed to Israel, he was told that his son Joseph had died and he wanted to go down to the grave with the son Joseph. But later on, the Lord blessed him with a son named Benjamin. And when Joseph tested his brothers, he said, bring Benjamin here. And the brothers reasoned, they said, we can't let anything happen to Benjamin because our father's life is bound to the boy. If something were to happen to Benjamin, our father would go down to the grave. And you think about how a parent longs for um, their children and how that father must have been sitting on that porch day in and day out, looking and longing, hoping that his son would come home. That is the heart of the father. When the son comes, he says, Father, I'm unworthy. And his father hears nothing of it. He, he falls and he kisses him and he grabs him. And he says, put shoes on his feet and put a robe on him. I don't know if he came home barefooted, if he was unrobed, but his father sees to his need. And he clothes his son. And he says, kill the fatted calf. Macedonia United Methodist Church. He says, kill the fatted calf for my son who was dead is now alive. And they begin to make merriment and there's, there's the music and the dance and the instruments and the father is rejoicing. Now we see another son who, who uh, doesn't understand the heart of the father. He's out in the field and he comes in and he's wondering what's going on and he calls a servant and says, hey, what, what's that smell? What, What's daddy cooking up the lamb? What's going on? And why do I hear music and, and, act, and festivity? And they go, oh, your brother who is gone has returned and your father's ordered the killing of the fatted calf and rejoicing. And the son, the older son, the, the dutiful, obedient son is upset. He's angry, it says. And he, he won't go in. He won't go in to, to, to rejoice. It's so bad that his father has to come out to him. He throws a party, a pity party or a tantrum and he stays out in the barn. Maybe he's sharpening the, the tools or, or patting down or, or, patting down or uh, rubbing the oxen or whatever you might do out in the barn, but he, he won't come out. And so his father has to go out to him and he says he entreats him. This older son never put two and two together. How his father maybe had blank stares at the dinner table. How there was a spark out of his eye. How he sat out on the porch every evening. How his father seemed to have uh, a look of, um, of concern in his face day after day after day. Maybe he saw it and he, he tied it to the idea that his brother left. But after a while, he no longer cared. He, he no longer cared about his father's feelings and about how he was worried about his, his young son. But rather, he just saw himself and he said, Father, you know, I've always did everything you told me. I went to church, I got good grades in school, I ever did everything right, I got a job, I played by the rules. But you never gave me a fatted calf for me and my buddy. See, his eyes are on himself, not on the heart of the father, not on the heart of the lost. And so he only sees his own, his own lack, his own need, his own desires, his own cravings. He doesn't see what the father's been going through. Neither that, not only has he not seen it, he hasn't shared in it. He can't share, he hasn't shared in the breaking, therefore he can't share in the rejoicing. And he says, this son of yours, he didn't even refer to him as his brother, but this son of yours who squandered all that wealth, who squandered all the possessions. When he returns, he, he, dug, he dragged your name through the mud, Dad. He made us look bad and he squandered everything. And the father says, listen, son, you've always been with me. What mine, what's mine is yours. But then he says, this brother of yours who was lost, he reminds him that the lost are kin we are all sons of Adam. We are all fallen and into this corrupt and sinful world. And we must rejoice when one of us come home. And we must weep when they don't. And sit on the porch and pray for them and intercede. So the question might be that we might ask, when was the last time you prayed for the lost? 
When was the last time you wept for those who are wayward in the far country? When was the last time you interceded, wept and cried? When was the last time you rejoiced and looked for opportunities to share your faith? Have you not seen your Father? Have you not seen what He did on the cross? Not just for you and not just for me, but the mass of humanity that currently are walking in rebellion, who do not know Him, who are eating the food of pigs, and who are living a lost lifestyle. Do we not grieve? Do we not mourn? Do we not tarry for them in prayer? May we be found as Jesus was, eating with sinners and tax collectors, that we might not exchange one position as the younger son who comes back to God only to become the other son, who becomes now faithful in church and faithful in Sunday school and faithful in tithing, but yet not broken by the heart of God, not concerned for the lost. May we be found as Jesus, a friend of sinners, and may we weep, and may we plead, and may we intercede for them. That is uh, the Daily Rider, the Circuit Rider's message for today. As we are riding on these curvy roads, going who knows where. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed it. Well, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may He make His face shine upon you. This is just Brother James a fellow servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we labor together until he comes. God bless you.